On to the main topic, uh, which is war and deception. I'm actually going to start with the Spanish-American War, 1898, and I know that some people may think, well, how boring, you know, who cares what happened more than 100 years ago? There's a couple of reasons we're going to start with that. One is that if we don't understand history, we're doomed to repeat it. And the other reason is that by showing the pattern of events through history, we can uh, confirm the fact that America is indeed run by uh, the same oligarchy, because uh, there's a consistent pattern. It's not just Democratic administrations alternating with Republicans. Now, we're talking about the media, right? Now, back in 1898, there was no internet, there was no radio or television, and people got their news from newspapers, and the kingpin of the newspaper world in those days was William Randolph Hearst, uh, whose name became synonymous with yellow journalism, which means dishonest journalism. In his paper, the New York Journal had the largest circulation in America. New York Times was really nothing back then. His chief competitor was Joseph Pulitzer's New York World, but both men had a common objective, which was to get America into a war with Spain over Spain's colony, Cuba. Hearst began fabricating stories about atrocities that the Spaniards were allegedly committing in Cuba. For example, he said that the Spaniards were roasting Cuban priests. And here's some actual headlines from those days. Cubans fed to sharks, cries heard at night. They're taken outside the harbor and the silent ferryman comes back alone. Butchered 300 Cuban women, defenseless prisoners shot down by Spanish soldiers. Raided a hospital, more than 40 sick and wounded Cubans butchered. Well, these stories were all fake. In fact, there was no hospital at all in the area that uh, the New York world was describing. Then, on January the 24th, 1898, the White House decided to send the battleship Maine into uh, Havana Harbor, Cuba. Now, no minutes of that meeting were kept. And the very next day, January the 25th, the main sailed into Havana Harbor, and the Spanish were not even notified. And it just sat there for three weeks. It was doing no good. I mean, there were no American interest at that time in America to protect. And then this happened. Uh, this is the Spanish ambassador to America, Enrique Dupuy de Lome. And William Randolph Hearst paid bribes to have his private correspondence stolen. And in this correspondence, he found a letter critical of President McKinley, the president at that time. And the letter said that McKinley was a low politician who catered to the jingos of his policy, jingo meaning a war hawk. It was printed in uh, Hearst newspaper under this headline, the worst insult to the United States in its history. This was a violation of diplomatic immunity, by the way, to publish private correspondence. But this headline drove anti-Spanish feelings to fever pitch. And then two days later, the USS Maine exploded. 266 men lost their lives, and that's all that was left of the ship. Now, a U.S. Naval Court of Inquiry could not find any information that linked the sinking of the Maine to the Spaniards. In fact, Spanish sailors were diving into the water to save American survivors who were taken care of by Spanish doctors and nurses. But the yellow press had no reservations. Check these headlines out. Crisis at hand, Spanish treachery, uh, Spanish plot, and Americans were subjected to Propaganda pictures like this one. Look at this guy. He's pictured as, as a Spanish brute. He's half man, half ape, right? And he's got his bloody hand on the grave of the man. And look at his feet. It's trampling the American flag as if to say, come down here and fight me and you Cuba, you Americans. I challenge you, right? But would Spain have actually sunk the main? Actually, Spain had tried desperately to avoid war. They caved into demand after demand. You know, we, we said, you got to get rid of your governor, Weiler, and, and they did that. And for a land war in Cuba, their troops would have to come 4,000 miles, but Cuba's only about 100 miles off our coast. But most importantly, Spain had an old navy, it was mostly wooden. They didn't have the firepower of our navy, which was increasingly steel. This is Admiral Pascual Severa, who commanded Spain's Atlantic Squadron, and he warned his government of, quote, our lack of everything that is necessary for a naval war, such as supplies, ammunition, coal, provisions, etc. We have nothing at all. Now, this is borne out by two naval battles during the Spanish-American War, one in Manila Bay and uh, one at Santiago, Cuba. We destroyed both their squadrons at Manila. We destroyed their Pacific squadron. And at the Battle of Santiago, we destroyed their Caribbean squadron totally. And in those battles, we lost no ships. In fact, we only had one casualty in each battle, and one of those was from a heart attack. So why did Spain fight? You know, that's a good question, right? The reason they fought was this. The U.S. government gave them an ultimatum, you have to leave Cuba, evacuate it. Spain had ruled Cuba since 1511, almost 400 years. And everybody in Spain, whether they're liberal or conservative, thought that Cuba was part of Spain, just like we think Hawaii or, or Alaska is part of America. If they had caved into the U.S. demand, they would have faced a revolution at home. 
And so given a choice between revolution at home or a war we can't hope to win, we better fight the war with honor. And so that's what they did. But why did the American oligarchy want this war with Spain? Well, there are at least six reasons, and I won't go into them all. But I'll give you one that's pretty easy to understand. Cuba, by the 19th century, had become the wealthiest colony in the world and is the world's largest sugar producer. Back in those days, sugar was considered very valuable. It was called white gold, just like the Rockefellers would call their oil black gold. But to get a war going, you've got to control the president, right? Now, William McKinley was from Ohio which is the home of Standard Oil, which is why it's no coincidence that we've had more presidents from Ohio than any other state. Now, when he was governor of Ohio, McKinley went bankrupt and was bailed out by a group of businessmen led by this man, Mark Hanna, who was friends with John D. Rockefeller. They, in fact, been um, high school classmates. And Hanna was the front man for Rockefeller. After the bailout, he became McKinley's political manager and his handler. In fact, when uh, McKinley went to the White House, he actually invited Hannah to live right in the White House, although Hannah took up residence uh, very close. Uh, here's a, a political cartoon of the two uh, critics called the President McKenna. National Citibank was controlled by the Rockefellers in those days. By the way, it's still around. It, we just call it Citibank. Okay? That's what it is. After the war, they took over the Cuban sugar industry. Quoting Lundberg, quote, National Citibank during McKinley's incumbency was more significantly involved in administration affairs than any other bank. National Citibank benefited most directly from the war for Cuba, the Philippines, and indeed all of Latin America soon afterward became dotted with national city branches and the Cuban sugar industry gravitated into national city's hands, end quote. And here's an actual magazine ad from National Citibank boasting of its Cuban sugar holdings. By the way, Lundberg mentioned the Philippines, right? Uh, I don't know if you guys are aware of this, but the way we got the Philippines and Guam and Puerto Rico, we took them spoils of war after this four-month uh, one-sided war against uh, the Spaniards. That's how we got there. 